As I sit here, my mother, Suzanne Cusero, is out um, watching my husband plant his tulips. Well, not plant, but work on his tulip garden. He is obsessed with tulips. He's a Dutchman. And uh, anyway, so it's a lovely scene outside as I sit here. But um, so um, I'm going to start out reading a poem that's not mine. It's a poem that probably you've all heard called Wild Geese. Um, and it's by Mary Oliver. And it's a poem I absolutely love. Um, it's it's a kind of a, a lovely a lovely sense of forgiveness that I, I encounter every time I read this poem. Um, and then I was in kind of a silly mood and I ended up writing <laughs> a poem that was called Mary Oliver for Corona Times. And I will read that poem after the Mary Oliver um, original wild geese poem. And, and then a little bit about, about um, writing, read my poems. Um, so, so hold on just a moment while I get Mary Oliver's wild geese poem up. All right, so Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. I love that poem. I love Mary Oliver. Um, I, for so many reasons, um, but I, I do, it appeals to me personally, I, I must say, because I think as I'm always telling my students, we live in such an incredibly individualistic culture. Um, and this, uh, this kind of tempts us and reminds us to join something larger than the personalized, psychologized, tiny little individual self. Um, and for that, I'm very grateful. Um, so it is a lovely poem. I, um, you know, so yeah, then COVID-19 happens and um, I ended up writing a poem um, to, in, in large part in reaction to so many people who I was, was talking to um, who felt this incredible compulsion to work extra hard. And maybe that's worn off since, you know, last year, but this was way back last March, I think, um, when people were like, oh my God, you know, we're, we're, we're all in quarantine. Um, I need to um, write the next best novel, etc. And this was kind of my reaction to that. Um, I didn't mean this to be a poem that would ever be published. Um, it was kind of a funny poem, frankly, to write. Um, and so keep that in mind when I write it, or, or sorry, keep that in mind when I read it. Um, but it then went viral, <laughs> literally. I got, oh my, oh my Lord. For some reason, it really struck a vein, something that people needed to hear. So here it is, um, Mary Oliver uh, for Corona Times. 
You do not have to become totally Zen. You do not have to use this isolation to make your marriage better, your body slimmer, your children more creative. You do not have to maximize its benefits by using this time to work even more, write the best selling Corona Diaries, or preach the gospel of Zoom. You only have to let the soft animal of your body unlearn everything capitalism has taught you, that you are nothing if not productive, that consumption equals happiness, that the most important unit is the single self, that you are at your best when you resemble an efficient machine. Tell me about your fictions, the ones you've been sold, the ones you sheepishly sell others, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world as we know it is crumbling. Meanwhile, the virus is moving over the hills, suburbs, cities, farms, and trailer parks. Meanwhile, the news barks at you, harsh and addicting until the push of the remote leaves a dead quiet behind, a loneliness that hums as the heart anchors. Meanwhile, a new paradigm is composing itself in our minds, could birth at any moment if we clear some space from the same tired hegemonies. Remember, you are allowed to be still as the white birch stunned by what you see, uselessly shedding your coils of paper skins because it gives you something to do. Meanwhile, on top of everything else you are facing, do not let capitalism co-opt this moment, laying its whistles and train tracks across your weary heart. Even if your life looks nothing like the Sabbath, your stress boa constricting your chest. Know that your antsy kids, your terror, your shifting moods, your need for a drink have every right to be here and are no less sacred than a yoga class. Whoever you are, no matter how broken, the world still has a place for you, calls to you over and over, announcing your place as legit as forgiven. Even if you fail and fail and fail again, remind yourself over and over all the swells and storms that run through your long, tired body all have their place here now in this world. It is your birthright to be held deeply, warmly in the family of things, not one cell left in the cold. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> again, um, I think initially there was this sense of, oh, quarantine. Well, now we, you know, the Protestant work ethic, we've got to just um, produce and do all these amazing things and learn how to bake a chocolate tort, et cetera. So, again, um, it wasn't a poem meant to be published, but it was just fun to write and was kind of, in a sense, letting myself uh, relax a little bit, hopefully. <laughs> um, so again, I just, the next poem I want to read is a poem that is a, is a, a Vermont spring poem. And I wanted to read it. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite poems. Um, uh, and it's, it's different from the, the ones that I'll be reading after, but I couldn't resist reading a poem about the earth and, um, and spring waking up. So this poem is called Ladies Slipper Red Eft. As a child, I awoke to the furiousness of bees. All morning, my mother and I combed the woods for red eps, trout lily, trillium. I learned young the smell of God and soil. The first time I saw a lady slipper, 
I felt embarrassed. The pink veined pouches simultaneously ephemeral and genital. Floating toad balloons, half scrotum, half fairy, half birth, half death. Without the formalities of church and school, lust and spirit first came to me as one through the potent hips of spring. But flowers, like fear, once inside me never lay still. Amidst my restless stalking of the woods, I wanted something bulky to thank, to name, to explain all the impossible grace. So I dragged my thirsty body over the hills, into the trees. I let the plump red Fs, orange fingers tiny as rain, crawl across my neck, onto my cheek, half reptile, half elf, half earth, half magic. Years passed, spring after spring cycled through me. Again and again, I arrived in heaven through touch, lust even, for the wrinkled pouches of lady slipper, the soft lemon-bellied Fs that waddled pigeon-toed across my palm. Now I walk my daughter through April's black mud. It's been a long winter. She hasn't quite unfurled. Still, she sticks her ear into the cacophony of crows above us the way a dog sniffs at a tight current of scent. Across the meadow, the peepers gossip in their giant cities. Salamanders toddle over the black soil, back into the cold ponds they think of as mother. Awake, awake. What if God is walking through us, picking seasons, histories, humans off himself like milkweed from a sweater, wading through us, a slow giant through warm ponds, feeling the odd tickle of religions like tangled weeds at his feet. I watch my daughter Anna now in full bloom, despite the rain running outside barefoot, setting up doll's nests in the fields collecting moles, covering them in leaves, naming them even though they're dead. She skitters across the garden singing. She too is learning young the restlessness of rapture, the way beauty is hard to sit with, the way it bends the body into prayer, the way ripeness must be touched, soft, black earth of the garden, she and her brother are all fists and toes. I watch her digging into heaven, soil, toads, bulbs, buds, the craning neck of spring, and all summer, the sweet, long, green meadows. <laughs> so my daughter is now 21. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, so I wanted to share that poem. I, I also, I would like to, to read some poems from um, a book that I'm just finishing now, and it's, it's entitled Ethnography of a Feverish World. And um, as an anthropologist, uh, I, I also teach classes on anthropology of media. Um, I've had an, a really strong interest for a while now in how technology is affecting human consciousness and human emotions. Um, what, how is technological saturation, such as we have never experienced as in the past year, um, how is that influencing what kinds of feelings we tend to have more of and what kinds of feelings and emotions tend to get stunted because of so much not you know info stimulation 
and tons of emails, et cetera, right? So I've done research on this. Um, I've done field work actually in, in um, Bhutan of all places. So um, Bhutan was the last place ever to get internet and um, actually banned uh, MTV and fashion TV and um, the wrestling channel because of its violence. Um, so I was intrigued and I, I ended up going to Bhutan to do some uh, field work and work with youth there who had just been exposed to social media for the first time. Um, Bhutan is an incredible uh, Himalayan isolated country, uh, as isolated as one can be. Um, and it's very concerned about becoming their, their youth becoming technologically addicted to Facebook, et cetera, because they're very, very uh, afraid of what will happen to um, their Buddhist Himalayan uh, country if, if everyone becomes completely technologically um, saturated and obsessed and um, they actually shut down Facebook <laughs> for a while. Um, it, Bhutan's a small enough country where you can actually do that. Anyway, so um, there's a whole section in my book um, that is all about my um, study uh, looking at technological saturation and how it is influencing my children and myself and the kinds of feelings that technological saturation tends to stunt and the ones it fosters. Um, so in some ways you could say this, it's kind of like a sociology of emotions. Um, COVID-19 has been, I mean, phenomenal technological saturation. Um, so this first poem that I want to read um, is called, I Watch My Daughter Snort Google. Um, as, again, as many of you can relate to perhaps, um, you have children or grandchildren who um, you worry they're on their phone too much. What is this doing to them that they're on Facebook and Twitter and text, everything all at the same time? Um, how is this influencing them? So this was me watching my daughter as she seemed uh, to be snorting, <laughs> snorting Google. She's charged, alert, snorting quick coked up bits of info. Snapchats pulsing like Vegas in her veins, strays of Twitter texts, YouTube jamming her million neural pathways. Blinking neon billboards line the circuits of her brain, luring bits of stray ego into the side alleys named flashy, sexy, cheap, shocking, tragic, fun. I feel like a deer, all sniff and hesitance, hovering at the edges of her psyche's field. I resort to nagging, almost violent what it takes to lift her head from the screen. I touch her shoulder, she's quick to snap and flame, burning with impatience, frustration, greed, like flares along a highway telling me to stay away. What happened to the dopey, unpopular emotions? The ones that wobbled out onto the roads after a slick rain? The endangered ones now, the slow and smelly ones, like empathy, like awe, sympathy, confusion, and grief, barely lifting their heads to sniff around before flattened like roadkill. Yet, last night, it finally felt like spring. I watched her pale and doughy, hungover on bites, 
wade ghost-like into its free floating green. Despite her phone buzzing inside, the moon stuck to everything, pulling her with viscous milky threads. I watched her sink into the cold wild blades of grass, mud and fiddleheads, mineral bone and bud. I swear I saw whole vowels of awe rising from her mouth like bubbles, like Chinese lanterns rising. Adrian, we have had uh, lots of comments and this one's a little bit more pointed after this poem. So I'm gonna read this one. Right. It's so amazing, this notion of technological saturation and addiction, certainly a thing worthy of social critique. And yet in these COVID restricted times, we are utterly dependent upon it to connect, work, conduct business, not be totally isolated. So it's become something of a public good in a sense, rather than a social and psychological liability, just thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, I would, I would, um, I would agree. Absolutely, that there is a, a good in it. Um, and yet, I guess what I how I'd respond is to say we, I never want to give up trying to um, encourage myself, my students to also bring their laptops outside um sh you know uh shut your screen off for a moment and just listen to the sound of the words um i you know i completely agree it has been amazing the connections one has been able to have i taught classes through zoom um you know so i guess i i'm not um I'm not saying that it hasn't been incredibly helpful, but I'm also just intrigued by what kinds of feelings does tons of technology and stimulation at you all the time uh, tend to stunt or allow to unfurl, okay? So um, Nicholas Carr, um, wrote The Shallows, uh, what the internet is doing to our brain. And he talked about emotions that take a while to, uh, to, as I say in the poem, unfurl. And I do believe there are certain um, emotions and feeling states that take a little longer to unfurl, like empathy, right? Or compassion or awe and I think uh, one of the main things I've noticed in my teaching, even in myself, is there, the ability of, of little messages coming in all the time through email or Twitter or texts to just nip those, those, those feelings as they're starting to grow and to kind of um, put them, stunt them in a sense. Um, so. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, maybe I'll read a poem that's about teaching just to give you a sense of, <laughs> um, this poem is called Teaching Online All the Time. This is what sorrow looks like now, okay? So I teach a lot of classes on refugees and so war is a big part of my classes. Um, I teach some pretty tough stuff in these refugee classes about asylum seekers, um, you know, what do refugees go through? So this is kind of a, um, an observation of how students respond emotionally now compared to when I first started teaching this in 1997 <laughs> at St. Michael's College. Um, and I, I, this is sort of a, just a little poem about the difference in how they react. Long ago, after my class on women and war, emotional carnage was the norm. Walking to my office, I'd offer Kleenex as the students shuffled after, 
faces pudgy with full-blown sorrow. I'd slow down out of respect for the heaviness they bore. Sitting in my office, it took forever for them to dry out. Now, I don't have to worry. After a film on ISIS rape, I'm good to go. No complaints of being triggered, no weepy aftermath, no need to process. It's what happens backstage on Zoom. When slow cook sadness starts to simmer, congeal, packed by flocks of hungry texts, tweets spackled by the internet's rabid beak. Long ago, sorrow was greasy, sticky, dark, bold, how it stuck to the body, oily, even toxic, like Van Gogh strokes. Now, sorrow looks like pointillism pastels, the tiny size bites, the air, the space between. When class ends at noon, at 12.05, I'm off to lunch. I'm texting as I walk, sporting evolution's latest organ, my nimble fingers flying from Snapchat to Iraq, Instagram to Sudan, mincing sorrow, empathy, till they dissipate so effortlessly. Peck, peck, TikTok, TEDx, tweet, and text. Behold the internet's shiny beak. So, um, I also, um, I wrote a poem called The Human Techno Body Meets Quarantine. Um, and I think uh, what I've been amazed by in my own observations of myself, my children, my students is how revved up people are um, from being online you know, kind of all the time or having this phone on them all the time. And it occurred to me um, that we have relatively revved up bodies now as humans. <laughs> um, and um, Newton's first law, which is bodies in motion stay in motion or at rest unless acted on by an outside force. So my son was learning about Newton's first law. And I remember thinking, but Newton could never have imagined the kinds of bodies that humans have now, which are just buzzing in, in many ways, right? So this is called the human techno body meets quarantine. Heading back to Vermont on the airplane, my son memorizes Newton's law as he studies the collision portion of his driver's ed manual. 10 more minutes of studying until he can have the padded remote, perfectly crafted to fit his hand and predict his finger's logic. Six Wi-Fi hours later, we land, lurch forward, our bodies belted in place despite the airplane's suctioned forward thrust when we taxi to a halt, I want to tell him that Newton didn't account for the kinds of bodies resting half a century later that buzz and hum unmistakably technoelectric despite being caged, reverberating furiously with old media bites and searches we Google suck at warp speed. That in these liminal pandemic times, when life is a boxed bardo, perpetua pur purgatoria, the thousands of channels and tweets we have surfed and snorted up till now still glow, writhe, birth, and die like embers in our nerves. Sparks fireworking across synapses, making shrapnel of our calm. I want to tell him, despite the safety belts, which tell us we are solid, separate, still, despite the plane's elevator music cueing us like dogs, 
to stay, stay. Though we are heading into lockdown, we will still be spinning and spackling like meteors, restless, combusting, discreetly discharging our manic atoms by pacing, crossing and uncrossing our legs, picking our nails, sanitizing our hands, chewing gum, fidgeting through purses. And yet all of this barely enough to calm the rabid cells inside us, the endless flocks of neurons whose murmurations still startle, dodge, dart this way and that. Because I just want to sit and hold his hand, I resist the temptation to tell him that someday we humans will learn to leave our bodies, cells gone, gone, nowhere and everywhere, both particle and wave, that we were never really clumps to begin with, no forward or backward, no harnessing, no holding. And once we finally know this truth, like angels, we will never come back, never be homesick, never held captive again. I think I'll read another uh, a poem that I, I wasn't thinking I would read this poem, but I think I will. Um, I don't know how many of you have witnessed barred owls in your yard. <laughs> Um, the frozen snow, not, not happening now, obviously, but I think it was like three weeks ago, um, made it so that the barred owls have been unable to get at the moles and everything they love to eat. Um, and so I called, um, I experienced this barred owl right in the plum tree in my yard, and I was ecstatic. It was absolutely so thrilling for me to have a barred owl just sitting there. And um, <laughs> I had no idea it was because it was in sort of starvation mode, literally, and that it was waiting in a sense for um, birds to come to the bird feeder near my mother's uh, window. Um, I went up to the bird, I, it never moved never moved. Um, so I was able to get about six inches away from the face of this barred owl. And um, anyway, it's a long story. Um, I tried to catch it. <laughs> they told me to catch it um, because I, I could then bring it to a place where they could intravenously give it fluids and um, not to bother trying to give it meat because it was too weak to even accept meat. Um, anyway, so the whole thing was uh, hugely, a very powerful experience for me, but also made me think about the way in which humans now during this time of COVID are also sort of trapped behind ice and screens and are hungry. Um, so this is called subnivian, which just means what happens underneath the, the, the snow, basically. Um, ground frozen, mice and voles on lockdown below. Still they skitter beneath, not even the fox dares to leap and dive into the snow caught with a glassy sheath of ice. The barred owls too are starving, crouched near bird feeders in broad daylight. This morning I spot a huge one huddled in the gangly clutch of our plum tree, tucked deep into its speckled feathers. I tiptoe up, no matter how close it doesn't budge, watching me but lapsing into sleep, grunting as it dozes off in a dopey hunger trance. I dangle lunch meats in front of its beak in nearby branches, nothing. Only the tree now with its savage flags of flesh. My iPhone nestled in my pocket, 
I can't resist. I unhook myself from my awe just long enough to send owl photos. You know the rest. The awe, the wild, now covered in emojis, dumbed, dulled, and disnified. When the owl flies off, a great longing swells in its place. So I pace the house, restless. It's not just the owls, but the humans who are starving, the bodies of loved ones just behind the screen's slick, screen, the screen's slick exterior. I zoom my elderly mother there, but just out of reach. She doesn't know how to enlarge her screen. I can't see you, I think she says, but she doesn't know her mute button is on. She's confused, fumbling with her laptop keys, subnivian, lost in the maze of internet tunnels that make her feel dumb. She claws the screen as if trapped under ice. I want to swoop down, clutch her with my tender hooks. I want to hear her gasp. I want to help her breathe. So um, I can keep going. I, um, I'd be happy to read one final. I just wanted to make sure we have enough time for questions, um, but I'd be happy to read one more. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think I'll read Cybirds. Um, so I, um, as an anthropologist who studies uh, media and social sat or technological saturation and how it's influencing our consciousness. I'm constantly looking for positive ways to view this arc of our evolution. Um, I'm constantly, I, I wanna live in a world where I think that this is taking us to a, a better place. And so a lot of times I just try and tell myself, um, you know, that, that who knows what miraculous spiritual sacred aspects of this encounter with technology are sort of, are happening right now. Um, and in a sense, the sacred can nest anywhere, um, <laughs> even in computers. So, um, this is a poem called Cybirds. Um, one, I found an app that allows my texts to alert me through bird song. Another noble attempt to combine techno with spiritual. Someday, my monk friend says, chips in the brain will cue us to breathe mindfully stimulate the oceanic religious part of our brain. One nudge from the chip and our brain will have no choice but to perceive the self as interwoven with everything. Two, at nine, after my father was killed, I fled to the woods when my mother became all beak and bone. The fluted song of the hermit thrush, its toppling cascade of liquid ribbons, soothing me as nothing else could. Back from my walks, my brothers sniffed me out, sitting glum inside our dark house, their bowls of stewed rage steaming. Wanting to hurt me as much as they were hurt by his death, they lunged at the source of my solace, told me of the true violent, true violent purpose of birdsong, to fend off other males and mark their territory. That was not the first time they took the sacred, 
pinned it like a desiccated frog in Darwin's cold lab. Even now, they would tell me, a scan of my brain back then would simply have shown what neurotheologists call a, quote, photograph of God, a deep azure like an indigo bunting glowing on the left side of my cerebrum. So when my iPhone chirps, a red-winged blackbird, I'm saddened when it zaps me into fight or flight mode, a flux of electrons along neurons screaming all the shit I have to do. In the meantime, I watch my children peck at their screens with a hunger that scares me. Hush, I tell myself, you can't go home again and it's no use longing for the past. Be patient, my monk friend says, as he gently pats my iPhone as if it were alive. Over time, he says, eventually God learns how to nest anywhere. Thank you, Adri. Folks are welcome to put questions in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and say something if you like as well. There's a, there, the comments are, you know, Wonderful, love listening to you read. Uh, less questions and more, um, you know, this is fantastic. <laughs> Hi, Adri, this is uh, beautiful. Hi. Do you have anything that you might say to uh, inform us of how you perceive the intersection of your being an anthropologist with being a poet? Thank you. Yeah. Um... It, when you do you mean do I have any poems that are how do, how do how do those two things live with each other inform each other spur each other uh-huh yeah. exactly okay uh, inform your outlook on yeah on absolutely and poetry yep um over the years so I'll just start out by saying so I was in graduate school at Harvard at um really tough department of um, social British anthropologists who would have died if they knew I was sneaking off and writing poetry. Um, but I had to do it. And I ended up taking classes with Louise Gluck and some great people while I was there, but that was sort of undercover. Um, and I guess what um, the way in which they meet, I guess there's a couple reasons. I felt like when I was writing my dissertation, um, I've never been so miserable in my life. Um, and it was because I felt like I had to be sterile and quote, scientific and object, you know, completely leave the poetry out of all the humans I was witnessing. And that was horrible. And I just decided then and there, I can't do that again. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I uh, there's a lot in academic writing that, frankly, um, I don't even assign to my students because a work of art can do, perhaps convey something about a culture in a more visceral and sensual way. So I'm a really big proponent of teaching ideas about culture and experiences of people cross-culturally through art, through plays, through paintings, through photographs, through poetry. Um, so in part, it's just, it's my intrinsic need to kind of put the flesh on what sometimes feels like cachectic writing that's just, you know, um, passionless in a sense. And that's not how humans are, <laughs> not the humans I know. Um, the other thing I've noticed too is um, I just uh, wrote an article, well, yeah, wrote an article that was published in this, this uh, journal called Anthropologica. And it's basically me saying, who are we to say poetry cannot be an ethnographic tool 
that we use to understand cultures and other people. Because when I write these poems, it brings me into kind of a um, fierce uh, meditative focus on the moment where I uncover so many observations, um, insights in a way that I sometimes don't get to in academic writing. Um, so the whole article was basically on, um, you know, yes, I do participant observation as an anthropologist, I travel, etc. But I would, I really feel that poetry is also one of my tools, um, scientific tools that I that I use to um, probe, you know, some of the, the most subtle nuanced aspects of, of human relations. Um, so I, I really, um, luckily also anthropology has become incredibly open to creative writing and they know, anthropologists know that, um, you know, we want to get our work out to a, a broader audience and we, students love to read ethnographies that feel like novels and, and draw them in. And um, that's the kind of writing we need to reach kids these days. So I even use my poems in my classes. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> oh, that answers it beautifully. So you, your colleagues, some of them might consider you a little transgressive with this or are you, are you saying that uh, in general, the, the field of anthropology is becoming more accepting of your, your slant on this, the writing? Oh, slant? yes, yes. No, um, I, what's funny is that uh, I remember a while back when I first started to publish poems in main journals, and um, I remember someone at St. Mike's was reviewing my files and was like, hmm, you're writing poetry. And ironically, he didn't know that, um, that this was actually the most cool and in vogue kind of, this was a great thing for anthropologists to be doing. And that the, you know, every time I go to the American Anthropological Association, um, I lead poetry workshops. Um, they're, they're really behind this now. It, I think it's people who, don't know a lot about anthropology who might think, what are you doing? You know, um, can you still get tenure by writing <laughs> ethnographic poems? Um, and I think that's really too bad. Um, but um, no, I've, I've studied with some amazing anthropologists who are also poets and write, you know, creative, nonfiction, et cetera. And it's also just the kind of writing I want to read. I don't want to read dry, sterile ethnographies of humans that make me feel completely unemotionally attached, um, or I should say detached. So, um, so yeah, no, I'm fine. I, I mean, I'm fine now with with uh, writing a lot of poetry, and it tends to go towards both anthropology journals as well as um, you know American poetry journals and books. So, well, mm -hmm. I'll just wrap my questions by saying, I wish you had been writing anthropology texts back in the. 80s when I was in undergrad and for work I was reading textbooks for uh, learning disabled and vision impaired students so they could get their materials that way. Mm. And I've had to read anthropology textbooks and yeah dry. Needed a yeah. few glasses of water to get through it so yeah uh, would have been yeah. nice to have your creative slant on writing texts like that back then but thank you so much. Yeah I, I would like to say that you know, I've taught at St. Michael's College now for so long. 
And I, I really do believe that this generation now is so technologically stimulated that it takes a lot to get their attention now. It really does. And ironically, what I find what works best is, for example, not even doing a PowerPoint, but just being a human in front of them <laughs> um, who is not slick and perfect and doesn't have right angles. Um, it's like they're not even used to that. So it's like it gets their attention even more than a PowerPoint. Um, and I use more and more art because they're just so pummeled with information, et cetera, that I'm trying to find things that viscerally grab them, that stick like Velcro to their soul. And that's what I find um, works the best right now in teaching. Yeah. But Adri, I'm glad that you um, stopped being an undercover poet, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. the thing that you talk about, um, you know, first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, this reminds me of John McPhee's writing, this beautiful writing about all these, you know, just anything that's mundane or, um, you know, you know, too uh, scientific to whatever, and, and just beautiful prose. So I really appreciate this. I think your concept of, and it just keeps striking me that um, we've lost an ability to think a lot of things, but the word awe kept coming at me many times in your, your when you were talking about that feeling and how can you have that, you know, so. Yeah, so there, are, there aren't a lot of rituals in place right now in our culture that ask us to stop our frenzied movement and let awe really unfurl and yet that's what we need that's what we need i think um you know when's the last time someone said no grieve longer <laughs> or when's the last time someone said no, just sit and feel that compassion kind of heat up in your body. Um, you know, I think it's just so easy uh, now to, in the, in the God of productivity, to just, you know, answer that next text, that okay. next email. Um, but at what cost, you know? Um, yep. Yeah, we have one one more comment. Um, Tom McCone says your comments about science and poetry are perceptive. Science needs to be objective, but the times when it has made the biggest mistakes, as with eugenics, have been when it stepped too far from the human level. It's too far from the human level. Yeah, I guess as an anthropologist, I would love to know uh, what you mean by the human level. Um, I don't know. Am I allowed to ask questions back? <laughs> um, you Tom, know, there. let's see. I was just seeing Thomas. If he wants to jump in, he's welcome. Yeah. I have a question. If if you're finished with the last one. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you, I love your poems. I really do. And as someone who has been working on uh, for 20 years on um, uh, precaution with wireless and cell phones and so on and so forth, I can totally understand what you're talking about. A lot of that is actually biological, what you're talking about, the buzzing body too. But I wanted to know, uh, have you... Um, have you got any plans to do workshops this summer at all? Uh, you mean as in poetry workshops? Yeah. I haven't. I, I mean, everything's kind of been put on hold. Um, I was going to uh, be at, I've, I've taught at the New England Young Writers Conference at Breadloaf in Middlebury and love that. And that, again, is not happening. 
Um, I'd love to do something this summer, but I feel like, um, yeah, there's just been a big retreat, um, but I, I don't have a, any plans to do um, workshops, but I'd love to. So. Uh, what about Zoom kind of things? Yeah, you know, Zoom is growing on me. Ironically, it really is. Um, uh, there, there, there's an intimacy you can you can get to in Zoom that surprises me sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, I would I would definitely consider Zoom poetry workshops as well. Yeah. Thanks. Where can we? Um, is this collection, uh, has it been published yet? Or where can we find your, your work, Adri? Yeah, um, so, well, the, let's see. The first two books you can get on Amazon or, frankly, support BOA Editions, which is the publisher. Yeah. Um, support them. Uh, the first two books are called Hunting Down the Monk, and the other one is called Refuge. And they're much, uh, Refuge is about my work with Sudanese refugees and my uh, travel in East Africa, my work. Yeah, so it's, it really is, um, a lot of it's based around South Sudan, my experiences there. Um, this, this one, the, it's called Ethnography of a Feverish World. Um, I'm still, I'm just starting to send it out but I'm not, you know, so no, it's not published yet. Um, if you have any connections with great publishers, let me know. <laughs> um, I just sent it actually to you, Toronto Press, um, because they do amazing work with um, kind of ethnographic poetry and hybrid forms of, of literature. Um, so in the middle of what I, of the, um, the book that I sent them is actually, it's poetry, it's ethnographic poetry, but in the very middle is uh, a creative nonfiction piece. And then it ends with poetry. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, loving all of the hybrid forms of creative writing that are out now. It's yes. remarkable. So. I, I put a link to BOA editions um, with your collections in there. So people look it up. <laughs> Adri, if you did a workshop, uh, how could we find out about that? Um, you know, I would say uh, I, unfortunately I'm not that skilled with Facebook, but <laughs> I, <laughs> Neither am I, neither am I. Yeah, I, I'm no. not, not good at it, but I am an avid and devoted emailer. Mm -hmm. So if you want, I would say just email me and I always get back to people via email. Email for me is lovely. It's kind of, you can really write, and respond in more depth than um, so I'd be more than happy for you to just keep my email and touch base with me in, in a month or two, that would work. Um, and it's pretty easy if you just Google me too. I'm at, I, uh, you know, St. Michael's college, just type in my name and it, it'll probably have a way of finding my email. Oh yeah. That's how we found you. Um. Yeah, is that how? Okay, yeah. Hey, you know, Adrian, you can, um, if you send that to me when, when you find out anything, we can amplify it a little bit through our channels too. Yeah, yeah. I will say, um, I'm just looking at my dear, lovely colleague and poet, Sue Burton now, who is also with us. And um, we are now, the two of us, part of um, a Vermont Feminist Women's Poetry Collective. And we are trying, we're just in the very first stages of like, okay, what do we do? All these women poets, 
let's offer some workshops. Let's support people. Let's support women poets. Let's, you know, in Vermont. So, frankly, if you have ideas about what you'd love, email me that too, because our next meeting is the 25th, I think, of April. Okay. Yeah. And um, that's one of the things that we'd love to do is support women's voices. You don't have to be some established poet. Um, you know, um, we'd love to, to do workshops or, or, you know, reach out to us in terms of, well, how do I send something out to get it published? Or how do I get feedback on my work? Um, so, you know, feel free to reach out and, and we're just starting up and I'm really excited about it. <laughs>